Well, it's good to, uh, to be back after a couple weekends away. Uh, spent a, a weekend two weeks ago in Dominican Republic with a couple guys from the church uh, checking out a, a missions organization that is doing just incredible work in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and uh, just getting some things set up so that we can uh, be a little more uh, aggressive with some of our missions efforts. And so really, really anxious, really excited uh, for some of those. You'll be hearing more about that as we come into the, the next few months. If you have ever thought about doing a short-term mission trip, uh, we have a way to make it very, very easy, uh, simple for you uh, now at this point with the relationship that we are currently building with Mission of Hope. So just really, really grateful for that relationship and the opportunity that it kind of opens uh, for all of us. To, to take a few days or a few maybe a week and to just go and see see what we might do to to share the love of Christ and to serve others who are doing a good work met some really incredible pastors in the Dominican that are doing amazing amazing ministry and God's working powerfully there so that was encouraging it was fun uh, to be a part of that and then uh, last weekend just uh, Sarah and I have an opportunity to uh, take take a week off and I'm so grateful for April and for Brian I haven't had a chance to listen to Brian's message yet but I know he always does such a great job and uh, I always hear from lots of folks here that appreciate what he has to bring so uh, really nice to have them be able to, to share with you over the last two Sundays and I uh, hope that you you've been blessed by by what they had to share we're gonna jump in to a brand new series this morning called overcomer uh, but before we do so, just wanted to also remind everyone that, or at least the men in the room, that Wednesday morning is our next men's breakfast, 6 a.m. right here in this building. Uh, usually there's somewhere between 30 and 40 or so of us that have breakfast together and <coughs> uh, always uh, just is encouraging to spend a, a little bit of time uh, in the morning together in the midweek. So Wednesday morning, 6 a.m. Gentlemen, we'd love to have you join us there. Also, Easter, as Vince mentioned, is only four weeks away. So as you're thinking about Holy Week, just know that we have several events planned for you on Holy Week. Wednesday evening, we'll be uh, participating in the traditional Seder or Passover meal. Uh, and we are looking for a few volunteers if you'd like to participate in that kind of behind the scenes, prepping some food and helping us get ready for that meal. Uh, you can let us know on your connection card <coughs> that you'd like to help with that. Uh, we've got some fairly simple food prep on that, but uh, to serve maybe 200 people, uh, it takes a few hands. So let us know if you're interested there. <coughs> also, Good Friday, we'll have a, a service uh, just to commemorate the incredible sacrifice Christ made on our behalf there. And then, of course, Easter Sunday morning, normal service times at 9 and 11. And we will jump in there. So Wednesday, Friday, Sunday on Holy Week, you can start planning for those events. This last week, I came down with a <clears throat> kind of a nasty chest cold. <clears throat> Feeling much better. But I still got a little bit of uh, residual stuff going on. So... Uh, I should be fine this morning, but just so you know, that's, it's whatever is left of that kind of late winter bug. Let's jump into things. We are going to be in Matthew chapter 14 today. Uh, as you are turning in your Bibles to find that or, or on your devices to, to join us in Matthew 14, let me just ask you this. When was the last time you needed to just step away and kind of emotionally catch your breath? You remember the last time you just kind of had it? You'd had enough. You're like, I, I, I'm out. I just need a little bit of time. Uh, I need to walk away and to collect myself <coughs> to make sure I respond well to others. Maybe for you, life was just overwhelming at the time. You, you, maybe you were just dealing with some stuff that seemed big and exhausting and you weren't totally sure how to navigate the, the struggles that you were facing, or maybe it wasn't even bad stuff. Maybe it was just big life decisions, and, and you were just feeling overwhelmed, not sure what you should do. 
And, and if you sit on that for a while, it starts to wear on us, doesn't it? It, it begins to, to feel very much like this m- mountain that you have to climb that maybe is insurmountable. Or, or perhaps you, you were just coming out of a season that just seemed to be go, 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 go. Uh, uh, two or three years of having young children and that, that whole baby stage or a new job or maybe you graduated college and you're starting a new career and moving to another part of the country and you're trying to get yourself established or, or maybe business takes off in the middle of your career and there's growth that you hoped for but maybe didn't anticipate at the pace that it was going and life is just a hundred miles an hour and you you just kind of put your head down and go but after several months you realize I I can't keep this pace anymore maybe you walked through an intense period of loss where uh, key relationships have broken down and dissolved and you find yourself feeling lost and lonely. Or perhaps <clears throat> you've dealt with sickness uh, and, and you, you've come through cancer treatments, but it's been exhausting, a long, hard road, and, and you don't feel like you did before. You're grateful for the healing that doctors have been able to, to help you experience, but, but you're not the same that you were before the treatments began. And you wonder if you ever will be. Or maybe you have come alongside someone else who's going through one of these intense periods of life. And you've been giving care and counsel and you've lent lent support along the way. And you've just given and given and given. And you realize that your emotional tank is just empty. There are seasons in life where we, we just all of a sudden wake up one day and think, I don't know that I have anything to give anyone else today. And it can be a a dangerous place, a difficult place for us to to navigate when we're just not sure. The last time emotionally that you just thought, "I, I just need a moment. I just need a little time to catch my breath. As we've mentioned, Easter, the most important, most pivotal moment in all of history is just four weeks away. We, we could argue that it's not just the most pivotal central moment in all of history, but it's the most central, pivotal, important moment in all of eternity. Eternity hinges on what happened in those few days. And as we come up to Easter, I'd like for us to walk through the book of Matthew, at least the latter, the second half of the book of Matthew. And to just kind of take a, a closer look at, at Jesus' experiences in the last months of, of his public ministry. As he moved closer and closer to the cross, Jesus, Jesus faced several obstacles, several challenges. And And as we walk toward Easter, my hope is that as we examine his life and and look at the things he faced and how he worked through them and overcame them, one, that we would be encouraged. We'd be encouraged for our own journeys, but two, and even more importantly, that we would be drawn to worship the one who has experienced life just like you and I. And then we'd be drawn to give him the the adoration (coughs) and the accolade that he so deserves as the ultimate of overcomers. So let's do so together. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that Jesus was on a pretty intense journey the last several months of his life. One of the first places that we we see that start to play out, <clears throat> is here in Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to read to you the account of, of how this all began, starting with verse 3. <clears throat> now Herod had arrested John, this is John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's 
wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful, lawful for you to have her. And so John had been criticizing Herod's brother for, for his new marriage. And it upset the whole Herodian family. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered him a prophet. <clears throat> On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. And so prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, you see, he painted himself into a bit of a corner, didn't he? Because of his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. What a, what a grotesque scene. This young girl dances probably a, a very sexually explicit uh, dance. And, and all the guests were so enamored by her beauty and this dance that Herod just kind of probably, most likely in, in some sort of, um, we'll say, drunken stupor promised to give her whatever she wanted. And she looked to her mother, and no doubt this conversation about John and his <coughs> criticism of her mother, no doubt in the family, they had had several conversations about their feelings of John the Baptist, and, and her mother kind of gave her the nod, yes, yeah, let's, let's finish this. And so she demands the head of John the Baptist. And it wasn't just enough for Herod to have him beheaded and executed in prison. They brought the head before the entire dinner party so that everyone could see and gloat over his execution. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Now, John and Jesus were quite close. They had grown up together. John is the one who baptized Jesus. Jesus adored his cousin, appreciated the ministry, the difficult ministry that John had performed. John was the one who, who prepared the hearts of God's people for the coming of the Messiah that they had so desperately desired for centuries. And word comes to Jesus that his cousin, his friend, had been executed and beheaded. When Jesus heard what had happened, verse 13, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Why? He's, he's deep in, in grief. He feels intense sorrow and and Jesus comes to this place in his ministry where he's been pouring out, he's been giving, he's been helping, he's been teaching the crowds. It's just constantly on the go. <clears throat> and he receives word that his friend, his cousin, John, has been beheaded. And so Jesus needs some space. And so he retreats. But hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. You see, Jesus climbs into this boat. He tries to get away to the solitary place, and, and everybody catches wind that Jesus is leaving this area and heading across the Sea of Galilee. And, and so from all of the towns, they begin, they begin to go on foot to race and try to get ahead of him wherever it is that he may land. When Jesus landed, verse 14, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them. And he healed their sick. So while Jesus is desperately trying to find some space to, to make sense of what's happened to his cousin, the crowds keep coming. The responsibilities continue to, to present themselves before him. And he sees them and, and he has compassion on them and he begins to heal their sick. Now he's in a remote place. 
He's retreated from the fishing villages that dot the shorelines of the, the Sea of Galilee. He's tried to get away to a place that, to try to go camping. He, he heads to the UP. And when he crosses the bridge, there are thousands of people waiting for him as he parades into to town. And he has compassion on them. And so he, he begins to minister to them. And he begins to heal their sick. And, and this happens all day long. And, and it starts to get dark. And it goes into evening. And, and again, they're in this remote place. And the disciples are like, hey, we still got lots of crowds. <clears throat> it's dinner time. My stomach's been growling for quite some time. What are we going to do about all the people? And you know the story. Jesus is like, we'll feed them. And they're like, feed them with what? And what do you have? And there's this kid that's like, well, I got some bread and some fish. And Jesus with the loaves and the fish feed 5,000. Matthew says 5,000 men. And so most likely most of them came with women. And perhaps many of them came with children. This is a large crowd. We're talking 12, 15, maybe 20,000 people. This is a huge crowd of people. The fishing villages that dot the shorelines of the Sea of Galilee in the first century maybe have a thousand people in them. This is a, these are massive crowds of people pressing in on Jesus who just needs a moment to grieve the loss of John the Baptist, and he now has, has ministered to them all day and into the evening. Verse 22. <coughs> After he finishes <clears throat> taking care of this large crowd, Matthew says, immediately... Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. We have these two incredible stories, the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water and calling Peter to him. And we kind of normally land on the, the fun stories. But, but I think it's important for us to also recognize that in the midst of this, Jesus is in deep pain. And, and he went to retreat. <laughs> he was headed off at the pass. So he, he took care of what needed to be done, but then he goes back to it. Jesus felt deep sadness. He felt sorrow in these moments. He was grieving. Sometimes, sometimes we read these stories and we, we kind of emotionally sterilize Jesus. Jesus had it all together. I mean, he's the son of God and he came and he just ministered to people and he was so loving and tender and wonderful to all the people. And, and Jesus is just lovely. And that's all true. But Jesus also felt emotion. He was also completely human. And he had bad days. And, and as he gets closer and closer to the cross, those bad days come more and more frequently. And Jesus feels his way through them emotionally. And it's important for us to recognize and appreciate that one of the things Jesus had to figure out was how to appropriately handle emotions that we often categorize as negative emotions. <coughs> how did Jesus handle negative emotions? Well, we, we see here in Matthew 14 that he felt sadness. Matthew chapter 23 says that Jesus grieved over Jerusalem. He, he considered their, their unwillingness over their entire history to, to repent of their sin, to, to submit themselves to God's desires and to his will for, for their, their lives and for their nation. 
They refuse to listen to God. And, and Jesus finds himself in Matthew 23 just overwhelmed with sadness for the entirety of God's people. In Matthew 26, in the Garden of Gethsemane, just hours, if not minutes, before his arrest, the night before his crucifixion, Jesus says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Overwhelmed with the point of sorrow, or to, with sorrow to the point of death. We read in John chapter 11 when his friend Lazarus died and Jesus goes to be with the family when he saw Mary, Lazarus' sister, weeping and the Jews who had come <clears throat> along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and he was troubled and two verses later we're told that Jesus wept. Jesus broke down and cried over his friend Lazarus and the pain that he was watching his family and his friends experience. As a result of his loss, <clears throat> Matthew tells us, along with the other disciples, or the other apostles, that, that Jesus felt emotions like indignation and frustration, that he showed disappointment and even anger. These are intense emotions. These are emotions <coughs> we're often encouraged to suppress in our lives. And yet we see Jesus not only experience them, but express those emotions. That should give us comfort. That, that should encourage us as disciples of Jesus that not only are the emotions you feel normal and natural and appropriate, but but we, we can and we should express them. Now, there are appropriate ways to do so, but Jesus experienced and expressed emotions. We do as well. When he faced disappointment, when he was frustrated with his disciples who some days were great and other days were complete morons, when he gets angry with with the established religious leaders who refuse to recognize <coughs> what God is doing in their midst. They were the most well-educated, most well-trained. If anybody should have recognized, and we know that some of them did, even Nicodemus knew who Jesus was. But because they had built such lavish lifestyles for themselves, because they wielded so much authority and influence and power in their own culture, they, they were unwilling to let that go. They were unwilling to recognize what God was doing. In Mark's gospel, <clears throat> there's a point where Jesus is asked to, to prove his spiritual authority, his identity, and and the religious leaders ask for miraculous signs. And, and Mark says in chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus sighed deeply. <sighs> I love that so much. This group of religious leaders asking Jesus to prove that he is who he has claimed to be. After he's healed countless dozens, if not hundreds, after he's taught the scriptures with authority and shown his knowledge of the word of God, his selfless ways, his willingness to, to sacrifice and set his grief aside to serve crowds, and they have the, the audacity to ask for another proof or sign, and they don't even ask for it with, with sincere hearts. You see, they're already in Mark looking for opportunities to accuse him and to, to silence him. And he knows their motives. He knows the agendas that are driving these questions. And so when they ask for another miraculous sign, Jesus just <sighs> sighs deeply. An outward expression of his disgust and his frustration with them. He's not even hiding it with these guys. And he said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no, no sign is going to be given. 
No. He just outright refuses. I think to myself, how often do people ask something of me with insincere hearts or that's already been provided or given to them and I feel a a deep responsibility or need for the umpteenth time to prove or to do. (coughs) Here, Jesus says, no. No, you've seen what you need to see. You've made your decisions. You've you've already set a course for yourself and for your your heart and your your agendas. No, I'm not going to do it. Wow. Jesus said no. (laughs) Another time, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, another time Jesus went into the synagogue. A man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? They knew they were trapped. They knew they were stuck And the Bible says that they remained silent. And here's Jesus' reaction. He looked around at them in anger. If looks could kill, Jesus gave stink eye to those who had it coming. Man, that's so refreshing, isn't it? There's times where Jesus grieves and is sorrowful. And he's like, you know what? You you guys just got to go. (coughs) <coughs> immediately he put the disciples in the boat and he went by himself. There's other times where people had it coming and he just went, are, are we serious right now? And he looked at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. These guys are trying to trap Jesus. He knows it. They're just looking, is he going to heal somebody on the Sabbath? And they had, they had man-made rules against doing any work on the Sabbath. If you go to Israel today, and, and we, you stay in a hotel that has multiple floors, on the Sabbath, the elevators automatically stop at every floor, so you don't have to do work by pushing the button that you're staying on. So they had drawn the line so tightly, you could walk a certain number of steps, and after that it's considered work. You can't push the button, because that gives a command. It creates something new, a new order. (coughs) And Jesus knows what they're thinking. He looks at them in anger, and then he goes, show them your hand. I mean, in your face, right? Mic drop moment. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Or in Mark chapter 11, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts, began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. I mean, Jesus straight went off. He just starts turning tables of those who were price gouging People who had come to worship God, they needed to to offer sacrifices. And so the the sacrifices, the doves or the lambs that you could buy for a few dollars at home now cost dozens of dollars. They, they They were inflating the prices unfairly. And Jesus said, you have turned my father's house of prayer into a den of thieves. You're taking advantage of people. And he just starts tossing tables and refused to let them carry on business as usual. Friends, we are created in God's image. God, throughout the scriptures, feels emotions. We feel emotions. Some of them, some of them are a little tricky to navigate. Some of them feel unkind and intense. And some of them are hard to know what to do with. You are an emotional creature. 
You've been created to be emotional. It's part of being human. They are natural. Our expression of them isn't always right, but we do experience them. And so we look back at Jesus. What did Jesus do with his emotions? There were times where he expressed them immediately. Righteous indignation. Justified frustration. Holy anger. Compassionate, empathetic sorrow and grief. But there are times where we see Jesus take a moment as well. And that's important. In fact, here in Matthew chapter 14, it's one of those moments where Jesus says, I need some space. And so he and the disciples get into a boat to head off to this solitary place. <clears throat> when he gets there, there are more crowds. And so he deals with them and then immediately sends everybody home. You've been fed, you've been cared for, you've been healed, you've been taught, you've, the scriptures have been open to you. And he sends the disciples one way in a boat. As people watch the boats go, they know they're headed this way. The crowds go another way, and Jesus sneaks off to a solitary place. Jesus knew that there are times where he needed to retreat to prayer, to spend time in conversation with his Father. There are times that that he just had to get away and process and consider and speak with the Father. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. <clears throat> After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside. Man climbed a mountain to get away from, from all of us. Uh, I've been on that mountain, and it, it is a 600-foot rock face. It's a cliff. We drove up and climbed down. He scaled a mountain, a, a, the face of a cliff, to get away from the people by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. <clears throat> and then a couple verses later, it says, it was just before dawn when he went out to be with the disciples. He dis dismisses the crowd at dinner time, and he takes the entire night to collect his thoughts. Matthew 26 says, when Jesus, uh, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. This is the night before his crucifixion. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. <clears throat> he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He knew what was coming. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. We mentioned this a little bit ago, to the point of death. These are deep, deep core emotions. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus retreated to prayer in his most agonizing moments, in his most difficult moments. After periods of time where he had poured himself out to people, time and time again, he took time for himself. He recovered. He spoke with God. He recentered himself spiritually. Took care of himself. You see, maturity of faith allows us to, to understand when is the right time to do each of those things. To recognize our emotions. To take care of them. To see what's happening. To, to be able to, to speak and clarify, I'm angry, I'm disappointed, I'm wounded, I'm sorrowful, I'm overwhelmed, I'm stressed and anxious. We see God's people express emotions throughout the scriptures. Recognizing our emotions is part of, of growing up and being mature emotionally. Then to also recognize that there's sometimes we need to retreat with those emotions and make sense of them. We need to walk away for a little bit and ask the Lord, what do I do with this? I'm incredibly angry right now because of how I've been treated or what has been done to me or what someone took from me. Lord, I see that I'm angry. I understand that I'm angry. I, I want to make sure that I 
I respond appropriately. See, Jesus responded with his anger sometimes. There were appropriate ways to do that. I think in my life there have been, there have been times where I've, I've been appropriately angry. There have been a lot of times I've responded in my anger very, very inappropriately as well. To know the difference, to feel the emotion and see I need a moment to figure this out and and to be mature enough emotionally to ask for it and to say, I think I need to walk away from this conversation. I want to deal with this. I want you and I to work through this and figure it out. But I know that the things I'll say right now I I will say selfishly, I will say with my own motives and agendas, I'm not thinking clearly, I, I need, I need a few hours, I need a day. Can I pray about this for the week? And can we pick this back up? To be able to retreat and prayerfully consider what's happening inside us, so that we can then respond appropriately. To recognize, to retreat, and to respond. Those are all parts of dealing with difficult emotions. And we see Jesus do it here in Matthew chapter 14. It's okay to ask for time. Jesus did. Be like Jesus. Take a few minutes. Take a few hours. Take a few days. Work through things over the course of weeks or months from some of the deepest wounds that you've experienced. But don't wallow in it and and don't hermit ourselves because we see Jesus faithfully caring for others all along the way. He continued ministering to others even in the midst of his pain. When Jesus heard what had happened with John the Baptist... He withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Not sure that could be any more clear. He withdrew, he left the crowds privately, without the crowds, to a solitary place where there were no crowds. And when he stepped on shore, what did he find? Crowds. And so what did he do? He... He had compassion on them. He had compassion on them and he healed their sick. And then he fed them dinner. Church, we need to be able to differentiate our emotions with the reality that, that we are surrounded by crowds that see us, that need us, that watch how we respond. They are desperate for someone to teach and to share with them the truth of God's great love for them. They need to experience it because many of them have not experienced true, appropriate, agape love anywhere else. Jesus tried to retreat. He ministered to people on his way there who needed it. And then he followed through, and he took the time. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him on to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And then after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And then he gets back to work as a a minister of reconciliation. I'm encouraged. Jesus was an emotional guy. Some of those emotions, we would probably encourage him to to just kind of tuck away. Jesus, don't be angry. We're church people. We don't get upset. And if we do, we hide it behind a nice face. Jesus, don't be disappointed or frustrated with them. I know, I, I know that he gets disappointed in me. 
I know he must be frustrated with me from time to time, and yet he continues to show grace, he continues to draw me to himself, <clears throat> continues to offer me forgiveness. And I'm so grateful for it. He felt emotions. He expressed them appropriately. When they were overwhelming, he retreated to make sense of them, to go to the Lord in prayer, that he might come back and respond appropriately. And as you read through Matthew, you'll, we'll see together that as he gets closer and closer to the cross and those emotions get more and more intense, Jesus maintained the mission. He didn't turn away from it. He handled it appropriately and ultimately overcame negative emotions. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you have shown us that you, you know every part of life just as we experience it, including, including difficult emotions. God, you know that there are those who grate on our last nerve. There are those who have wounded us and mistreated us and we, we have been scarred deeply as a result of their behavior. <coughs> Lord, we, you know that some of us carry deep hurts with us. And quite often we're not sure what to do with those. And so God, I pray that as we have been guided by your word this morning, that we would trust you, that we would seek you, that, that we would retreat to discover from you what you would have us to do. That our response would be appropriate to our disappointments, to our fatigue, to our sorrow. Lord, even to our excitement. There are times where uh, our passions get us a little carried away as well. Help us to be patient and to wait on you. In our joy and in our sorrow, may you be honored in all of our activity. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul.
just another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. I lost another one.
Christ hath passed away, your love has stayed the same, your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead, I breathe.
to do.